Okay, so this is really one of the main theorems that we'll see in the semester. And it's called the Marathon Convergence Theorem. And uh, it says the following. Consider a sequence of functions fn that are positive and measurable. And for every x, we have that uh, this is an increasing sequence. OK? Then the limit of the integral of f n d mu exists and is equal to the integral of the limit. Okay. This type of theorem is really the great motivation for the back theory. You want to be able to put your limit inside your interval. Right? That's, that's our objective in life this semester. Okay? And uh, every time we get such a theorem, we are very happy. Okay? Because that's really what the theory is, is for. And if you try to do these things with a Riemann integral, we, we look a little bit, you really need very uh, strong conditions on the type of, uh, uh, very strong conditions on your functions to be able to do that. This is rather light. I mean, of course, yes, it needs to be increasing for every x. But besides that, you, know, you can just get in there. It's also crucial that we are dealing with positive functions. Okay, this whole section is about positive, uh, positive functions. You'll see that when you drop that, you lose a lot. Okay, some things will be true, but uh, a lot less. This is very similar to the problem I had uh, when, when I redid the proof of, uh, to show that nu was a measure, because I had a finite sum and I pulled my limit out. In this case, I pull my limit out, but I have an integral. An integral is really a limit of finite sums. So I'm doing it, I'm doing uh, an interchange of limits, but with two infinity. Okay? That's why it's a big thing. If it were just a finite sum, Okay, we know that already. So a proof of this thing. Well, one direction is easy. You you have that. Uh, uh, so you f n of x for every fixed x, f n of x is increasing in n. So it has a limit. Of course, as always, the, the limit may be uh, positive infinity. And we call the limit f of x. Okay, that's how we define the function f. Okay, it's the limit of fn of x as n goes to infinity. It's also, if you think about the increasing sequences, you know that it's the supremum over all n of f n of x. That's how you prove that a monotone sequence has a limit. You, because you have a fundamental property of the reals that tells you that the supremum exists, well, unless it's infinity, and therefore that's the candidate to be the limit. And then you prove that you do have a limit. Okay, that's, that's how this uh, thing works. So you get this. And, uh, for free, you get that uh, fn of x is going to be less than f of x okay, for every n and every x, right? Because this is the limit. 
and it's a supremum. Therefore, that's what you get. And we know already that if this is true, then this is true. Okay, we have proved, we just proved that uh, if f is less than g, then the integrals are in the same order. Now the other thing, um, okay, the other thing we can uh, observe here is that f10 is less than fn plus 1, okay, for every x, and so fn is less than fn plus 1 dmu. So the, the sequence of integrals is increasing, and therefore it has a limit. Because this limit exists, I don't need to use lim subs and lim mins. I just use a limit. I, I pass to the limit on both sides, and I get that my limit is less than f d mu. Okay. But you see that every time, before using the symbol limit, I justify the existence of what I'm taking the limit of. So at this point, what do we have? Well, we have that the limit of the integrals is less than the integral of a limit, because this is defined as being the limit of f, of the, of the fn. Okay? So I don't have an inequality, an inequality. I just have one inequality. And I need to prove the reverse inequality in order to have what I want. So now we do the, the so, so we prove the reverse inequality. And we'll be done. Then what we do is we take phi a simple function. Uh, phi is between 0 and f. And f has been defined here. And we take a, a number in 0, 1, and consider En the set uh, the, the set of x's where Fn of x is bigger than A phi of x. A little side entertainment. How do we know that Tn is measurable? Always try to use some inverse image in these questions. Okay? What we have is that this is Fn minus A phi minus 1 of A positive infinity. No? OK, because the image of this thing is bigger than A. And this is a Borel set as being a closed set. And this is a measurable function as a difference uh, of uh, measurable functions. Therefore, our set here n is measurable. OK? That would make a very nice test question. So en is measurable. And then what we look at is 
what do we look at? Well, we, we make some observations. Uh, hmm. One is that uh, if I do, okay. So, if I take any x, so for any x, we have that fn of x goes to f of x, which is bigger than phi of x, which is itself bigger than a phi of x. So, uh, what I want to say is, okay, that there exists an N yeah. okay. there exists an N such that uh, if N is bigger than N, then uh, FN of X is bigger than a phi of x. And maybe it's better to see to see it uh, by a contradiction proof because so maybe let's let's forget for a minute about this. But by contradiction, if f n of x is less than a phi of x for every n, then we pass to the limit, we would get that f of x is less than a phi of x, which is going to be less than phi of x. And that's a contradiction because we know that our phi, uh, that our phi is less than f. So we would get a contradiction. Uh, as always, If, uh, let's see, well, if fn uh, of x converges to infinity, if f of x converges to infinity, if f of x is infinity, then fn of x must also go to infinity, and this is also true. So, in any case, what we are showing here is that For every x, there is n such that x belongs to E n. Okay, well, this is what we just proved. And therefore, the whole space x is the union of E n. So the, the E n's cover the whole space. So that's one thing. And uh, the other thing is that En plus En is included in En plus 1. This is because Fn is an increasing function. So if I know that my x is in En, it means that Fn of x is bigger than this guy. But fn plus 1 of x is bigger than this guy, so it's also bigger than this. Okay, because my sequence uh, fn of x is increasing, I have this. Okay, so now that we have that, we can uh, do the following. We look at, okay, well, first, so, first step, we have that fn is bigger than 1 en times fn. Why? Hmm. 
Why do I have it? Fn is bigger than 1 En Fn. And it doesn't matter that what the En is. Whatever indicator I put there, this is a true statement. Because this guy is either 1 or 0. So it cannot make it bigger than what it was. It can only make it smaller. That's all. Okay? So I take the integrals on both sides. Now, now let's remember what En is. Well, En is this thing here. On En, I have that Fn is bigger than A phi. So, this is bigger than uh, integral of 1 En A phi d mu. OK? Since I'm on the set, a, uh, Fn bigger than A phi, we have that this guy is bigger than this one. And maybe I should write this. So before we do that, so that's important. It's something that will come back. OK, so what I'm saying is that 1 En Fn is bigger than A phi. Well, Two possibilities. If x belongs to En, if x belongs to En, then Fn of x is bigger than a phi x. And so uh, we have 1 En of x, Fn of x is bigger than a phi x. Oh, I forgot my en here. That's why it's not. I can feel a little uneasiness. OK. If x belongs to en, 1 en x is 1. And fn of x is bigger than a of phi x by definition of en. And this guy is 1, 2. Now, if x does not belong to En, then both sides are 0. Because this guy is 0, and this one is 0. So the inequality is also true. So in both cases, x belongs to En or not, we have that this is a true inequality. OK? So let's go on with our integration. So if we believe that, then we go down here and we take integrals of the two things. Let's, so remember, we started with this guy here. So let's rewrite it. Fn d mu is larger than this, which turns out to be larger than this. So that's a phi 1 en d mu. But this is our friend nu. OK, remember the measure nu? You, you fix your simple function, and you define a measure nu uh, by this interval. So this is nu of en. So you get this. We know that this has a limit, okay? because we, we, we have argued that uh, since fn is an increasing function, the integral of fn is an increasing sequence. And we can take the limit on both sides. 
Now, why can I take the limit on this side? Why is it OK to take the limit on this side? The EN is a sequence of increasing, is an increasing sequence of events. And nu is a measure, therefore this limit exists, and it's nu of the union of EN. But the union of EN, we said, is X. So we get A nu of X. Which means that which means that this limit here of fn d mu is larger than a nu of x, but nu of x is 1x phi d mu. 1x is 1. Everybody's in x. So that's identically 1. And therefore, this is a phi d mu. Uh, now there are several things to, to be done. First thing, remember that A is any number between 0 and 1. And I could, uh, you know, just, uh, I could have taken A, uh, uh, I could have called it one, 1 minus 1 over k. I can do that for every A k. And then I let k go to infinity in this inequality. And this goes to 1, which means that this limit You see, on this side, there are no A, so I don't have to worry about this. I just pass to the limit in A, and I get that this is larger than phi d mu. OK, I just let A go to 1, because A is anything between 0 and 1. Now, what's interesting is that then this becomes an upper bound of the set of phi d mu where our phi is simple and between 0 and f. Right? It's bigger than any of these guys. So it must be bigger than the least upper bound, the supremum. I should have given a name to this thing. So this must be bigger than the supremum of this phi d mu over all phi's. But this supremum is precisely f d mu. So we get our reverse inequality. The limit of the integrals is, equal, is bigger than the integral of a limit. So maybe it was wise to take the break before the proof. So it's, it's a, rather, a rather intricate proof. But if you look at it step by step, there is no difficult step. It's just that there are quite a few steps. So that's, that's uh, again, a fundamental theorem. The monotone convergence theorem is very important. We say monotone, but it's really increasing convergence theorem. Okay, we're not assuming that uh, the Fn can be decreasing, only increasing. Well, there, there is a special case that you'll do for your homework, but uh, the, the theorem is for increasing sequences.
Okay, following step, now that we have this at our disposal, we can show that if f is positive, g is positive, uh, measurable, then the integral of f plus g is equal to f d mu plus g d mu. So the integral is a linear operator. Uh, remember that last time we showed that f is the limit of a sequence Cj where the Cj are simple and uh, Cj of x is less than Cj plus 1 of x. Okay, it's an increasing sequence of functions. Okay, any positive measurable function is a limit, is an increasing limit of simple functions. Okay, same, same thing for g. So that's going to be a limit of phi j, let's say. So now we start by writing f plus g d mu, and that's the integral of the limit over j of c j plus phi j d mu, and that's equal to the limit over j of c j plus phi j d mu. Why? Well, Cj plus Vj is also increasing. And so I can use the monotone convergence theorem to get this. Now, this is the limit over J of Cj d mu plus Vj d mu. What property have I used now? Is it the property I'm trying to prove? Which would be bad. Okay. We did that for simple functions. So we know it's true for simple functions. Now, the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of the limits because we know that each limit exists. By the monotone convergence theorem, again, we are going to get what we want. So at this step, we need to be a little careful because the sum may have a limit, but if you know, each, each part of a sum may not have a limit, but in this case, they do. So this is limit over j of cj. I should have started the other way around. It was better plus limit over j of phi j d mu. If we apply the monotone convergence theorem again twice, then this is going to be with my limit inside plus with this limit inside. And that's f d mu and this is phi d mu. So we prove that the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. G. Oh, g, thank you. OK? So we are crucially using the monotone convergence theorem and the fact that every positive function is an increasing limit of uh, simple functions. OK. Then we can do uh, many other things with this. Do I want to do that now?
Yeah, maybe let's do first Fatou. So all these guys were uh, mathematicians, French mathematicians from the 1900s. Fatou, Borel, Lebeg. So it must have been a blast to be around at that time with all these results flying around. But who knows, maybe they didn't talk to each other. I, I don't know the, the, the history of these things. Anyway, so Fatou is another one of these guys. And uh, that's another fundamental result. Because the, uh, the monotone convergence theorem is restricted because of increasing, because of a monotonicity hypothesis. Okay? We need to have an increasing sequence. So what do we do when we don't? That's where this is quite important. It's, it's, so you take a sequence Fn of positive functions that are measurable. And you have that the integral of the limb inf of the Fn is less than the limb inf of the Fn. So it doesn't give you a limit. Of course, it doesn't because you don't know that the limit of Fn exists. Fn is any sequence. But it does give you a nice relation between limb imps, which turns out to be very useful in many problems. Okay, how do you remember the, the direction? Well, the limb imp of Fn is less than Fn, let's say, because you know you are taking an infimum here. So if this guy is less than this, then you know the the this integral should be less than that, and then you take the limb imp and you get your inequality. Which is almost how you prove it, actually. It's, uh, the proof is quite easy. So remember that the lim inf of Fn is the, so what we do is the inf of Fk for k bigger than n. And then we take the supremum of these guys over all n. So let's call, let, let Gn be the infimum of Fk for k larger than n. Well, you are taking the infimum of something which is smaller and smaller. Therefore, your infimum is bigger and bigger. Okay? So gn of x is less than gn plus 1 of x. Okay? The gns are an increasing sequence of functions. OK? So. Uh, what you have by the monotone convergence theorem, so first thing, let's say, uh, that the other, the, ad, the other inequality which is useful is that uh, Gn is certainly less than F. Because I'm taking the infimum of all the Fks, and Fn is in here, so Fn must be larger than, than Gn for every x. Now I take the integral on both sides. And on this side, I don't know that the limit exists. So I'm going to take limb imps on both sides. We could do it with limb subs, but the result would be less, uh, less good, okay? because we, we have an inequality with limb imps. So limb imp of gn d mu is less than limb imp of fn d mu. But in the case of Gn, it's an increasing sequence. So I can apply the monotone convergence theorem. So by the monotone convergence theorem, the limit exists. 
and I can put my limit inside. That's the momentum convergence theorem that tells me I can do that. But that's, what's another way to write to call limit of Gn? Limit of Gn is also the supremum of Gn because it's an increasing sequence. Therefore, this is exactly the limb inf of Vfn. Okay? So limit of Gn is the supremum of a Gn, which means that this is the limb inf of Vfn. So the conclusion is that the integral of limb inf of fn is less than the limb inf of fn. Okay, so next week we'll have a test, and for the following week, which is October 17, I'd like you to do the following problems. Seventeen on page fifty two. Okay. Uh, one more property, or you're tired? How are? Were you able to appreciate it? Yes. So let's let's prove something else. So the integral of f is 0 if and only if, so uh, assuming f is positive as always, if and only if f is 0 almost everywhere. Okay. 
so if f is zero almost everywhere, then if you take your phi between zero and f, and phi is simple, uh, well, we can. The way we can look at this is that the the set of x's for which phi of x is positive is included in the set of x for which f of x is strictly positive. Right, if phi of x is strictly positive, then f of x is going to be strictly positive since we have this inequality here. But this is a null set. Therefore, this is a null set. Okay, the measure of this is zero. Therefore, the measure of this thing is zero. Okay, so the measure of x, phi of x is positive, is zero. Which means that phi is zero almost everywhere. Okay, I, I'm using bigger than zero. Normally, you would use different from zero. But of course, because this is a positive function, to be not zero means to be strictly positive. So phi is zero almost everywhere. But we know that if phi is uh, simple and zero almost everywhere, its integral is zero. We proved that last time. Okay, a simple function which is zero almost everywhere has a zero integral. So when you compute your f, which is the supremum of all the uh, phi d mu, where phi is simple and so on, well, you get only zeros. So the supremum of zeros is going to give you zero. Okay? And the integral is zero. So if your function is zero, its integral is going to be zero. Well, zero almost seven. Now, for the converse, uh, uh, what we yeah. So for so now assume that your integral is zero. Then, uh, and let the en be the, the set where f is bigger than 1 over n. Then, as before, we can say that f is bigger than f1 en. We take the integrals on both sides. This side turns to be 0 because this is our assumption. And on my uh, en, I know that my f is bigger than 1 over n. So this thing is bigger than 1 over n, integral 1 en d mu, which is mu of en, 1 over n, mu of en. But mu of n is positive and 1 over n is positive. So the only possibility to have something negative is to have mu of n equal to 0. Okay? So what this is telling us is that mu of n is 0 for every n. Now, let's have a look at our en again. Does the sequence en have some nice property?
Is it increasing, decreasing? It's increasing. It's easier and easier to be bigger than 1 over n as n increases. Okay? So if you are bigger than 1 over n, you are certainly bigger than 1 over n plus 1. Therefore, En is increasing. This limit exists. And is mu of union of En. And everything is zero, as always. But what's the union of all the ENs? What does it mean to be in the union of the ENs? Well, I claim it's exactly the mu of F bigger than zero. Because if I'm, if I'm in here, I'm necessarily bigger than 1 over n for some n. And if I'm in there, I'm certainly in here. So that's what we get. And, we can, and this is exactly the definition of f is 0 almost everywhere. Okay? Because the set where it's strictly positive has measure 0. And it is a positive or 0 function. So it's 0 almost everywhere. Okay? So that type of computation is really crucial to be able to do an inequality like this. Not difficult, but you really need to understand these inequalities. Okay, so let's stop here for today.